In the year 2002, there was a science fiction movie called Equilibrium, set in 2072 in Libya, a fictional city-state where the citizens are required to take daily injections of a substance that is designed to suppress emotion, because of the claim that emotion is the cause of all wars and violence. In the Star Trek series of TV shows and movies, an extraterrestrial humanoid species called Vulcans decided to restrain their tendencies to extremely powerful and violent emotions by suppressing them, or even purging them completely, and by living by pure logic and reason with no interference from emotion. Why am I mentioning it? From the previous videos posted on this channel so far, one might get the impression that emotions and feelings are enemies of clear, rational reasoning. But would it even be beneficial for humans if rational reasoning was devoid of any influence of emotions? Would it even be possible for the citizens of Libria to live a normal life? Well, in reality, the relation between emotion and reason is a bit more complicated. To explain it, we will look at the research performed by neuroscientist Professor Antonio Damasio and presented in his book Descartes' Error. One of his patients was a man that he referred to as Elliot. Elliot developed a brain tumor which had to be removed along with the frontal lobe tissue that had been damaged by it. After the surgery, Elliot remained an intelligent, skilled and able-bodied man. His perceptual ability, past memory, short-term memory, attention, learning skills, language and the ability to do arithmetic were intact. His IQ was in the superior range. Tests showed that he didn't lose knowledge concerning social behavior and that his financial decisions were reasonable. Despite all of that, he wasn't able to function normally anymore. Every day he needed prompting to get started in the morning and prepare to go to work. At work he was unable to manage his time properly. He had problems with interrupting his current activity and turning to another, more important activity. Or he might suddenly focus on something more interesting. He could suddenly turn from sorting documents, a job that he was supposed to do, to carefully reading one of those documents for the rest of the day or he might spend a whole afternoon deliberating how he should categorize the documents. Eventually he lost his job. He went through several divorces. He tried some new businesses, but in one of them he teamed up with a disreputable man. Despite several warnings from friends, he went bankrupt and lost all of his savings. He was an intelligent man, acting stupid and ignorant, unable to decide properly, especially on personal and social matters, and not learning from his mistakes. His intellect didn't change, but his emotions did. He became far more mellow and indifferent. He did not display sadness, no impatience, no frustration. He displayed anger only rarely and in swift outbursts, after which he quickly returned to cold neutrality. Topics that once had evoked a strong emotion no longer caused any reaction, positive or negative. Even when describing his own tragedy, he was emotionally detached, as if he was a dispassionate, uninvolved spectator. Another patient of Damasio participated in an interesting scene. Damasio suggested to him two alternative dates of his next appointment, both just a few days apart from each other. The patient began to consider which of the dates is better. He began to list reasons for and against each of the dates. Previous engagements, proximity to other engagements, possible meteorological conditions, and many, many more. He had been calmly and fruitlessly comparing costs and benefits of various options and possible consequences. After the better part of half hour, Damasio finally suggested to him that he should choose the second date. The patient then promptly and calmly agreed and immediately ended this fruitless analysis. Professor Damasio encountered many other patients with brain damage that resulted in the same combination of decision-making defect and flat emotion and feeling, despite intact basic attention, memory, intelligence and language. Basically, people who were smart enough to theoretically be able to make rational decisions but being unable to make them because their emotions and feelings were compromised. Based on his research, Damasio formulated the so-called somatic marker hypothesis. According to the hypothesis, we do not make a detailed analysis of every aspect of the situation, every available option, their current and future rewards and losses, changes over time, results of different nature, new possible scenarios that result from other scenarios, and so on. 
Instead, possible options are marked with emotions. When outcome that is being judged as bad comes to mind, we experience an unpleasant gut feeling, a mental and or bodily sensation. The feeling marks that what comes to our mind. This brings our attention to it and may lead us to reject the negative course of action and choose from among other alternatives. Positive somatic marker brings our attention to outcomes judged as positive and may lead us to choose from among them. We end up with a reduced number of options to which we can apply a deliberate and conscious analysis. So, Elliot wasn't able to make correct social decisions in real-life situations despite making correct decisions during tests because real-life situations are dynamic and they change in an ongoing, open-ended, uncertain way where every response provokes response from the other side, which changes the situation and demands another response, and so on. Elliot's defect in emotion and feeling prevented him from rapidly assigning different values to different options, which harmed his ability to choose the most advantageous course of action. The same was in the case of the undecided patient. He was forced to make a detailed analysis of the costs and the benefits of the two alternative dates, because none of the dates simply felt better. He also didn't feel that this entire scene he had been taking part in is embarrassing, or that he is wasting his own and other people's time. Somatic marker can work not only overtly, creating a perceptible feeling, but also covertly, outside consciousness. It can do it via signals occurring below our awareness, for example, by changing the behavior of certain neuron groups, and in result, inhibiting the tendency to act or enhancing the tendency to withdraw. When we intuit a solution, emotion can also hide the knowledge used in reasoning. It delivers the conclusion so directly and rapidly that knowledge doesn't even have to come to mind. The conclusion was drawn based on the knowledge we have, but we aren't even aware of all the logical steps of reasoning. And the quality of the decision depends on the knowledge we have and how we have reasoned about it in the past. Those covert unconscious processes become the source of intuition, something that allow us to arrive at the solution without consciously reasoning toward it. And this mechanism of intuition, which covertly discards useless options, allowing only useful to appear in consciousness, works not only when thinking about social or personal problems, but in any other field that requires creative thinking and problem solving, like for example science. Those unconscious processes can arrive at conclusions and, based on those conclusions, guide our behavior by emotion long before we become consciously aware of those conclusions. This was displayed in a certain experiment where a group of people participated in a gambling game in which they chose cards, one at a time, from two red decks and two blue decks, with each card carrying a monetary payoff or loss. Some red cards provided large payoffs, others carried large losses, and the expected value of the red decks was negative. Some blue cards provided moderate payoffs, others carried small losses, and the expected value of the blue decks was positive. Players had to evaluate their options and select strategies through trial and error. It turned out that the players were able to consciously understand the underlying structure of the game after about 80 cards and report a hunch about the red decks after 50 cards. But these same players started to avoid red decks long before they arrived at their first conscious hunch, typically after only about 10 cards. They also showed physiological symptoms of stress, like sweaty palms, in response to red cards at precisely the same time that their behavior began to change. So, as you see on all of those examples, emotion not only can help effective rational reasoning, but it can even be required for it. So, the Vulcans from Star Trek and citizens of Libria, after getting rid of any emotions and feelings, wouldn't even be able to normally function. Without emotions, most probably they wouldn't even care about maintaining their emotion-free society. But when emotions and feelings related to our attitudes, values, convictions, likes, dislikes become so precious in themselves that they need to be protected, then we fall under the influence of mechanisms like motivated reasoning and countless other biases that make us defend against all reason and logic. To prevent that, one should be aware on which side of the emotional force one's thinking is at a given moment, at the side where it helps rational thinking, or at the side where it harms it.